without any further ado, we would like to continue with part two of this first uh, presentation on the topic, Mystery Babylon, the Mother of Harlots. Um, as we just left off, we left off where it says that the notos of a horn was actually broken off. And in its stead, there were four that stood upon it, even four kingdoms that shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Then I have a quote from one of the people that have written history, and it says that after Alexander the Great died, there was a fighting amongst the people for who would reign. A single ruler did not arise, seeing that Alexander bore no children. If you don't sleep with women, how will you bear children? Is it possible for two men to come together and produce a child? Impossible. So then he was succeeded by his, as they call it in Greek, diadokoi, also known as successors. That's why it says, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power, meaning they, was, they shall not be of his own blood. Four of his generals arose to take power over the four main regions. Now bear in mind that all this happened before the Greeks actually came and conquered Medo Persia. So Daniel was foretelling time before it happened. Because at this time, Daniel sat in Babylon. And the ones that were empowered then were who? Were the Babylonians or the Medes at that time. And lo and behold, after that, they were conquered by the Greeks. So he was able to foretell time before it happened. And he pinpointed the precision that a goat would come, would conquer this kingdom. And then the goat, his horn will be broken off, and then meaning he would die. And then four generals or four horns shall come out of that place of the one horn. And history confirms it that Alexander was succeeded by four of his generals. To the students of history, the first part of his kingdom, Macedonia, was given to General Antigonus. So go and find out General Antigonus. Search him out. The second part of his kingdom, the kingdom of Asia, which was called Asia Minor even today. And today it is also called modern-day Turkey. The one that took over there was his general by the name of Lysimachus. Lysimachus. He was generally ruled western portion of Asia Minor in addition to Thrace in Europe. And the third part of his kingdom, Syria, was ruled by Seleucus. In addition, he also ruled over parts of Asia itself. And the fourth part of his kingdom was ruled by Ptolemy. He was known as the infamous Cleopatra, was the last Ptolemy to the rule of Egypt. So to the students of history, you can find out the four generals of Alexander the Great, pinpointing it directly back to prophecy. And then I will have a very interesting point to make. That as you read, just if you just see how the Medo Persian kingdom, which was the second kingdom, was considered as being one kingdom, the Greek and the Roman kingdom also was considered as coming from the same he goat. Because the small little horn that would speak blasphemous words, it would come from that same he goat. Meaning that they came from the same stock of family. The Roman Empire was a continuation of the Grecian Empire in some sense. That is why even in history today, you will hear that the Europeans will tell you that modern day civilization sprung from Rome. And if you go back to the Romans in their books, they will tell you that the Romans got their civilization from where? From the Greeks. Because they spring out of the same stock of family. Now Daniel chapter 8 verse 23 as we are continuing. Daniel 
Daniel chapter 8. Daniel from chapter 8, verse 20 and 3. Go ahead. And in the latter time of their kingdom. And in the latter time of their kingdom. When the transgressors are come to the full. When the transgressors have come to the full. A king of fierce countenance. Behold, our king of very fierce countenance. And understanding dark sentences. Uh -huh. Shall stand up. He shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty. And his power shall be very mighty. But not by his own power. But not by his own power. Why? Because the Bible says you receive his power from whom? The red from red the red dragon. Red. Go ahead. And he shall destroy wonderfully. And he will destroy wonderfully. And shall prosper and practice. Go ahead. And shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And he shall destroy the mighty and the holy people, which stands for the children of Israel. And uh -huh. through his policy also. Stop there. All of this is confirmed if you read the first book of Maccabees, 1st Maccabees, both chapter 8 and chapter 9. You will not go into that, but if you don't have the apocryphal books or the apocrypha, then it is just about time that you bought yourself the apocrypha. If you go to the King James Version, the Bible, the King James Bible, the 1611 Version, That's right. if you look it up, you will see that the King James 1611 Version you will see that it has the Bible as we know it, but it also has the Apocrypha within it. And in that Apocrypha, you will find the first and the second book of Maccabees. Many people, when we read the final book of the Old Testament, many people, when you read the final book of the Old Testament, which is the book of Malachi, and then we turn over one page and we enter into the New Testament, we don't know how it happened. How is it possible in the times of Malachi, the children of Israel were in Babylon and some were returning to Judah. But then all of a sudden, when you go to the New Testament, there is a ruler in Israel by the name of Herod. We are missing an entire piece of history. Very true. The gap between Malachi and Matthew, the New Testament, is the first and the second book of Maccabees. If you read it, you will understand how the Romans came to be in Israel. That is why they remove these sacred books from what you call the Bible today, so that you would be fooled and would not know your history. But the Bible says, can there anything remain hidden under the sun, and shall Elohim not expose it? So I advise you, go and buy the Apocrypha and read the first and the second book of Maccabees, especially chapter 8 and chapter 9. And then you will understand Daniel 8 a bit more. So, we are continuing. It says, verse 24, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully, wonderfully and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the set-apart people. Now give me Revelation chapter 17 and 10. Revelation chapter 17. Uh -huh. From verse 10. And it is still speaking about the woman that is, or the harlot that is riding upon the beast. Revelation 17 and 10. Uh -huh. And there are seven kings. Now I will explain the seven kings. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. Five of these kings are fallen. And one is. And one is. And the other is not yet come. But as for the other, he is not yet come. And when he cometh. So five are fallen. And one is, meaning at the time of John, he was the sixth. And the other one, which is the seventh, he's yet to come. But when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Talking about seven kings. Now give me Daniel 8 and 21. Daniel chapter 8, verse 21. Go ahead. And the rough goat. As for the rough goat. Is the king of Grecia. He is the king of Grecia. And the great horn. And the great horn that is between his eyes, that is between his eyes, is the first king. Is the first king. Now I know that many students of history, when they read this, they will say the seven kings are the seven kingdoms that rule the earth. That's what they will say. And then they will start their count, not from, and then they will start their count from Assyria being one. And then they will count Egypt being two. Then they will count Babylon being three, etc., etc., etc. But this is not biblically so. Why is it not biblically so? Because the Bible says in Revelation, 
17 and 10. It said, And there are seven kings of the which five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. But when they counted, they count Roman or Rome as being the final kingdom. But let me tell you this. When John was speaking this, he was saying that he, at the time that he was living, he was at the dispensation of the sixth kingdom. And if they count and say Roman is the seventh, John says there are five kings. Five are, there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is that was in the time of John. And one is to come. The one that is to come is the seventh. But in the time of John, the Romans were already there. So they are the six. So their whole count is not correct. Okay. So let's see what the right correct is. Daniel 8, 21, it says, The great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Is the first king. So you should count from that one as being the first king. Alexander the Great was the first king of the seven kingdoms. Go ahead. 22. Now that being broken. Now that being broken. Whereas four stood, whereas four stood up for it. Four other kings shall stand in its place. Four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation. If there are four kingdoms, there must be four kings. So Daniel is one, and then four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. But not in his power. These four kings are what? If you count Alexander being the first king, and then you count the four generals of which I gave you the name. Four plus one equals what? Five. It equals five. So Alexander one, Antigonus two, Lysimachus three, Seleucus four, Ptolemy five. And then John said what? In Revelation 10, 17 and 10. Five are fallen. Alexander and the four, at the time of Daniel, they were living. But at the time of John, they are dead. That's why in Revelation says five are fallen. Because when Daniel prophesied, he prophesied 600 years before John would come and prophesy again. So in the time span of that 600 years, the first king came and died. And the four, and I mean, the first king came and died by Alexander. And then his four generals also died, which represent the five kings that are fallen. And then he said, bear with me. And then he said, five are fallen and one is. That one is, or that one was at the time of John. When he was living, who were ruling the world at that time? It were the Romans. The Romans were ruling the world at that time. The Roman Empire were ruling the world at that time. That's why you will see that. What did the Messiah say? Give unto who? Give unto Caesar. The thing that belong unto who? Unto Caesar. Because the Romans were in world domination at that time. That were the six. So the six are the great Caesars of Rome. They are the six. Now the question is, who was the one that was yet to come? And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Who took over after that the Caesars died? As I said in the introduction, if you are worth paying attention. The one who took over, when it says the Roman Empire, it was, and then it was not, and it shall arise to the bottomless pit. What will happen after Rome fell as a world power? The Caesars would die, and then it would continue as a spiritual entity, spearheaded by who? By the Pope. The Pope is the seventh. The Pope is the seventh. He's the one that is yet to come, because at the time of John, it was ruled by the Caesars. The popes were not yet inaugurated as being the one responsible for Rome. Okay. So after that, the one that is yet to come, that was the pope. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So those are the seven kings. Alexander won his four generals, uh, five. The sixth king at the time of John was the one that is, which are the great Caesars of Rome. And then the seven, which was yet to come, as, was the pope. Because there's a difference between the Caesar of Rome and the Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome is the Pope. So with that being said, let's look at the Acts of the Roman Empire. Daniel 8 verse 23, still continuing with history. Daniel chapter 8 from verse 20 and 3. Go ahead. And in the latter time of their kingdom. And in the latter time of their kingdom. When the transgressors are come to the full. When the transgressors are come to the full. A king of fierce countenance. Uh -huh. And understanding dark sentences. 
shall stand up. He shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty. And his power shall be very mighty. But not by his own power. But it shall not be by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully. Uh -huh. And shall prosper and practice. Uh -huh. And shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Uh -huh. And through his policy also, uh -huh. he shall cause the craft to prosper uh -huh. in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. Uh -huh. And by peace shall destroy many. He will come in the name of peace, but he shall destroy many. He shall fight against the holy people. He shall come against the set apart place. And through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper. Uh -huh. Verse 19. Verse 19. Uh -huh. And he said, uh -huh. Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last, in the last, in no. the last end. Daniel 7, 19. Daniel 7, uh -huh. from verse 19. Go ahead. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. And then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. Which was diverse from all the others. Because he was different from all the others. Exceeding dreadful. Uh -huh. Whose teeth were of iron. Uh -huh. And his nails of brass. Uh -huh. Which devoured, uh -huh. break in pieces. Uh -huh. And stamped the residue with his feet. Uh -huh. And of the ten horns that were in his head. Uh -huh. And of the other which came up. And of the other that came up. And before whom three fell, uh -huh. even of that horn that had eyes, mm -hmm. and a mouth that spake very great things, Go ahead. whose look was more stout than his fellows. Uh -huh. And I beheld, mm -hmm. and the same horn made war with the saints. Jump to verse 23. From verse 20 and 3. Uh -huh. Thus he said, and then he said, the fourth beast, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. It shall be the fourth kingdom upon, upon the earth, earth. Uh -huh. which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, which shall be diverse from all the other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth and it will devour the whole earth and tread it down and tread it down and break it in pieces this is what the fourth kingdom shall do now give me revelation 17 and 6 revelations from chapter 17 uh -huh. from verse 6 uh -huh. and i saw the woman and i saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs and with the blood of the martyrs of Yahushua of Yahushua and when I saw her and when I saw her I wondered with great admiration just like Daniel looked at the fourth beast and wondered because of all the destruction that he would cause John he saw the woman that was riding upon the beast this religious entity spearheaded by the Pope and he was amazed how all the world were drunken by the blood of the saints that she spilled. And how all of the world were filled with the blood and the martyrs of Yahushua. So this saint or this harlot, this woman, was persecuting the saint. Even as the Bible said the fourth beast would come and would set his hand against the holy people and against the pleasant land. And would start to rise even against the prince of hosts which is Yahushua. Now with that said, let us look at the persecution of the early day believers. Here I have some statistics that say that the total number of Christians that were martyred, or the total number of early believers that were martyred in the early church, is, it remains unknown. However, out of the 54 emperors who ruled between 30 AD and 311, about a dozen or 12 of them went out of their way to persecute the believers of old. It has been calculated that between the first persecution under Nero, if you like history, go and study the evil reign of Emperor Nero in the year 64 until the Edict of Milan in the year 313, ushered by the Caesar who we know as Constantine, Early believers experienced 129 years of persecution and 120 years of toleration and peace. So over the 300 years, 50% of the time, the people of the early believers, the saints of old, they were persecuted and they were being killed. Now, if we look at the history of the persecutions, at least since the 5th century, it has been customary to count 10 major persecutions in the early gathering of saints, a number that nicely parallels the 10 plagues of Egypt. Now, these 10 persecutions were one, especially under Nero in Rome, 64 AD until 68 AD. Do you know who Nero killed? Nero killed 
Peter and killed Shaul. Shaul, it is said that Peter, I'm sorry, he died in Rome. As he was in prison, they were to kill him. Then they brought him before a cross and they were to crucify him. And then he said, not so, not so. I will not die the death that my master died. Rather, take my head and turn it upside down so that I would not die the glorious death that my master died. And then the Romans came and they killed him, crucifying him upside down. And Shaul was beheaded. Do you know where? Also in Rome. The early believers were suffering persecution. That's why Shaul said, I know that even my end has also come. But nevertheless, fear not for me. For I have kept the faith. I have run the race. I have finished it. And now is laid before me a glorious crown of life. And not only for me, but for all those that shall endure. And as for Peter, it was prophesied in the book of Acts. It said, Peter, Peter. Three times, if you love me, feed my flock. For whilst you were young, you went to places you wanted to. But behold, the days are coming in the future that someone will take you to a place where you will not want to go. And even there, you will perish. That is also how Peter died. He died under Roman persecution. He died under the rule of Nero. He died under the rule of the Caesars of Rome. And after that, many persecutions follow. So you have to understand, and this is what I wrote, just to give us a bit of understanding. Because many people wonder and they ask and say, but why exactly, as they ask, when you read Malachi, the Israelites were coming back from Babylon and they were in Israel. But why, or oh why, or oh why, or oh why, or oh why, if you go to Matthew, from Malachi to Matthew, all of a sudden Herod is in place. All of a sudden the Romans are in place. All of a sudden they are calling the shots. But let me explain what happened and why that is the case. Let me see if I can find all this for a second. Let me see if I can find that document. No, not that one. Once again, you're listening to an hour of restoration, restoring the broken walls. Um, I believe that we are learning a lot, as I will call it history, as one on one. Tell a friend to tell a friend that we are still live, so they can tune in on Facebook Live that's on the tune in app. That's right. Now, what I want us to understand before we go and continue about the persecutions of the Romans on the early believers is that what many people seem to forget is that in the days of Yahushua's flesh, the whole of the southern kingdom of Israel, also known as Yehuda, was under Roman siege. If you read first book of Maccabees, chapter 8 and 9, you will understand. That's why they removed it. So go ahead and pick first Maccabees, read it, and you will understand. Israel has a long history of being under Gentile rule. From the times of the kings of Babylon under leadership of Nebuchadnezzar, to the kings of Persia under leadership of Ahasuerus, and then from the times of the Greeks under leadership of Alexander the Greek and his four generals, to finally being under the rule of the Romans, under rule of, C of the Caesars. And Judea, which was a province of the Roman Empire, was under rule of King Herod of Idumea. The book of Daniel, the book of Esther, the book of Jeremiah, and especially the book of the Maccabees confirms all this. This explains why in the days of the Messiah, Yehuda was under Roman rule, and why Herod at that time was the ruler of Israel, under, under the supreme control of the Caesars. If you read Mark chapter 12, verse 17, just to confirm it very quickly. Mark chapter 12, verse 17. Mark chapter 12, uh -huh. and then verse 17. Go ahead. And Yahushua answering said unto and them, Yahushua answered and said to them, Render to Caesar. Render to who? Render to Caesar. Why did he not say render to the king of Israel? He said render to Caesar because at that time the kingdom was dispatched. Okay. There was no king in Israel anymore. Okay. Israel was a captive city under the rule of the Romans. The Caesars were in control. And Herod was the 
governor of Judah at that time. So Israel was under the siege of the Romans. And at this time, Israel was being oppressed and under the rule of the Gentiles. And these Gentiles were the enemies of Israel and thus the enemies of the Elohim of Israel. That was just to confirm that. So when you continue to read, you will see how the early gathering of saints were under persecutions. That is why when you study your Bible very carefully, if you read Revelation 2 and 3, where the Messiah has revealed himself to John and he's speaking about the seven churches that are scattered abroad, of the which the most churches were scattered and the places that were under the jurisdiction of the Romans, what would he say? I know that you are suffering. He would say, I know about this persecution. He would say, I know about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which are a set of the Romans. So he's telling them that I know how the early church, how you are under persecution. I know that you are suffering. I know this and I know that. So in order for us to understand the reasons for that persecution, we have to understand that the Roman distrust of Christianity, one must first understand the Roman viewpoint of religion. For the Romans, religion was first and foremost a social activity that promoted unity and loyalty to the state. So meaning that the religion in Rome was all just a social activity so that the people would bow down to the emperors and the Caesars. Furthermore, a religious attitude the Romans to the Romans were called as pietas or piety. And the Roman Empire itself was generally quite tolerant in its treatment of other religions. As you see Acts chapter, chapter 17, verse 16 to 31, where Peter was found in Rome or in Ephesus. And as he was found in Ephesus, he said he came to a temple. And in that temple, he saw many idols. So the Romans were accustomed to having and worshipping many idols. They did not care at all. Rome was an amalgamy, meaning all the other idols, all demons could come there and find their nest in Rome. And they found it no problem. As long as you kept obeying the Caesar, you were allowed to do whatever you wanted to do. However, this imperial policy was generally one of incorporation, meaning the local gods or deities of a newly conquered era were simply added to the Roman pantheon and often given Roman names. Even the Yahudins with their Elohim were generally tolerated. However, the Roman distaste for Christianity or for the holy faith of old then arose in large part from its sense that it was bad for society. In the third century, the Neoplatonist philosopher Por Porphyry wrote, how can people not be in every way impious and atheistic who have apostatized from the customs of our ancestors through which every nation and city is sustained? What else are they than fighters against deities? That's what they thought of the holy people of old. Hatred of the holy people of old also arose from the belief that the proper piety to the Roman gods was necessary and was needed to help sustain the well-being of the cities and of their people. Therefore, though much of the Roman religion was utilitarian, it was also heavily motivated by the pagan sense that bad things will happen if the deities are not respected and are not worshipped properly. Many pagans held that the neglect of the old deities, what made Rome so strong, was responsible for the disasters which were overtaking the Mediterranean world at the time of the apostles. Now, this perspective would surface again in the 5th century when the destruction of Rome caused many to worry that the deities were angry at the empire's new allegiance to the holy faith. What does that mean? Rome would accept you into their kingdom with whatsoever religion you have, as long as you would also acknowledge their gods, as long as you would also bow down to their gods. That was the ideology of the Romans. That is why you will see how the people of the old faith were being killed. That's why Peter was being killed. That's why Shaul was killed. Because being people of the old faith, they remember the covenant of Elohim. Where Elohim said, thou will bow down to no other El but me. Nor will you acknowledge no other El but me. Because of that, the persecution started arising. And the believers of old were being slaughtered. 
The believers of old were being persecuted. The believers of old were being killed by this Roman entity, by this beast. Now continuing. Now we are transitioning from how did the accuser all of a sudden become the faithful? How did the Romans who were killing the believers of old all of a sudden became believers themselves? A good question. How did that happen? Because now we see that the seed of Christianity is found in Rome. But how did that happen? Because the seed of the ancient and the believers of old was found in Jerusalem. How all of a sudden did the faith delivered to a people of the Hebrew stock find its roots now in the hands of the Gentiles? Yes. How did that happen? When Elohim said he delivered his oracles to Israel. Yeah. Until no other nation had he done this. Amen. So how did this happen? Lo and behold, there came an emperor in ancient Rome. So now I'm talking about the impact of Constantine on ancient Rome and modern day Christianity. If you claim to be a student of history and you claim to be a Christian, you ought to know the name of Emperor Constantine the Great. If you don't know the name of Emperor Constantine the Great, where is your faith built upon action? All you read is Acts, and specifically Acts chapters that, chapter 2, right? And they were all in one room with one accord, and then they heard suddenly, now they are preaching about the suddenly moment. They can spend hours speaking about the suddenly moment. How can you make and do such things nowadays? But people love it. Let me talk about the impact of Constantine on ancient Rome and modern day Christianity. So all the persecutions changed after the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine. But it says in history that when he was about to go and fight one of the great wars of Rome, because at that time Rome was in a decline because they were being punished. They did not know they were being punished because they were persecuting the saints. But they thought these people, they are ruling our kingdom because they will not bow down to our pantheon of deities. So Rome was in a struggle with one of the other kingdoms. And it said that on the way of his battle, Constantine all of a sudden received a vision. And he saw in the clouds a great sign of the cross. And in the Greek, and he heard a voice saying, with this thou shalt conquer. With this sign of the cross, thou shalt conquer. And all of a sudden he calls all his men to halt and to stop. He then went back to his garrison. And he commanded all the people to make banners with the sign of the cross. And there he confessed and he said, from henceforth, I will, believe the, I will believe in the God of these people. These people that always preach about the cross. I will believe in their God now. Because I received a vision that with this I will conquer. So, so, so that's where the, the whole cross Link to Christianity came from. That is where the whole cross link to Christianity came from. Interesting. And that is where it was publicized. Because it all of Rome's point of view changed when the emperor at that time, the Caesar at that time, Constantine the Great, also known as Constantine I or Saint Constantine, when he conversed and he and he repented, so to say, and he also caused the whole entire Roman Empire to become. Christians, as he called them. Now, he was a Roman emperor from 306 to 337 AD. Constantine provided religious toleration with the Edict of Milan in the year 313. Go and type the Edict of Milan, effectively lifting the ban on Christianity. So until 313, the ancient faith of old was banned by the Romans because they were persecuting the people of old. Now, the Edict of Milan is simply a proclamation that permanently established religious toleration for Christianity within the Roman Empire. It was the outcome of political agreement concluded in Milan between the Roman emperors Constantine I and Licinius in February 313. That ushered in the acceptance of Rome of the Holy Faith, which they then dubbed as Christians. Later in the year AD 325, Constantine called in the Council of Nicaea. Now the story is really starting to get interesting. Mm. I know many of the conspiracy people amongst us, 
Whenever you speak to them, all they can quote is Council of Nicaea. Yes. Let me explain a bit about the Council Please. of Nicaea. Please. Now in the year 325, Constantine called the Council of Nicaea in an attempt to unify what they call Christianity. Why did he try to unify it? Because what you have to understand is when the Emperor Constantine became a Christian, he did not become a Christian because he wanted to repent truly. All he wanted was to win. And by whatsoever means he could win, he would follow it. Because he received a vision and he saw a sign of the cross, he said, by this I will conquer. And then he conversed to being a believer of the cross or a Christian. And then he went on to fight and he conquered. Then he proclaimed Christianity to be the number one religion in all of Rome. But lo and behold, what happened? Because he was an emperor of many nations. Now there was a struggle of power. Because the Hindus, the Buddhists at that time, or at that time they were not known as they were known as the Mithraists. The Mithraists and the people of the Egyptologists, all the other nations that were also on the road, they would not bow down to the cross because they had their own deity. So there was now a fight and a tearing up of the kingdom of Rome. Because they said, like, how do you now cause us to bow down to the cross? In the beginning, the emperors that were before you tolerated all beliefs. Why are you now forcing us to have only one belief? We will not accept it. So now, from a strategical point of view, for all of us that like politics, emperor sat down with his counselors and said, what or what must I do to maintain the peace in my great and mighty Roman Empire? And then, lo and behold, he convened the Council of Nicaea. Many people say, yeah, everything happened at the Council of Nicaea. At which Council of Nicaea? Because there are more than five councils of Nicaea. Wow, really? So what he did at the Council of Nicaea, he sat down with all his wise men, and he sat down with all his priests at that time. And he said, I want to make a way that Christianity will be acceptable to all people. He wanted to make Christianity acceptable to all people. But Elohim is not an Elohim that includes all. That's right. The way of Elohim is follow me mm. or die. Mm. That's all it is. Mm. He said, I put before you life and death. Mm. He said, choose life, for that is where I am, mm. so that you may live. But if you choose to die, you will die. Right. But now Constantine introduced paganism inside of Christianity. He wanted to make sure that all the other nations that worship all their else, they would feel at home in Christianity. So he conveyed the great council of Nicaea, where he introduced paganism and he put it inside of Christianity and he made it acceptable to all. And then when he came back, all the people were in peace and they loved it because they could find the traces of their belief inside the new belief that Nero or that Constantine has introduced. So Constantine greatly impacted modern day Christianity. The belief of Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter, the belief of the ancients of old, is not the same belief that we are now having today. The ancient faith of old has changed wow. through the input of the beast. That's right. To the input of the Catholic Church mm. under the leading under the leadership of Constantine. Okay. They transformed our faith. Mm. They have turned around our faith. Because I, was, I know that you do not like the doctrine of the Nicolaitans mm. in the book of Revelation. Because many of the things that we are seeing nowadays in the church, where are the roots coming from? We cannot locate it in the Bible. Mm. It all happened because of the influence of the Romans. Mm. What I want to say is here is Constantine envisioned Christianity as a religion that could unite the Roman Empire, which at that time was beginning to fragment and divide. While this may have seemed to be a positive development for the Christian church, the results were anything but positive. Just as Constantine refused to fully embrace the Christian faith or the faith of the ancients of old, but continued many of his pagan beliefs and practices, so the Christian church 
that Constantine promoted was a mixture of, listen carefully, true ancient faith of the old or true Christianity and Roman paganism. Mm. If you want source, we will put it all down for you to read it yourself. The Encyclopedia Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica Premium Service 2004. So in this 15 minutes time before I close, what, I'm, what am I saying? I'm saying that Constantine found that with the Roman Empire being so great and being so vast, expensive and diverse, not everyone would agree to forsake his or her religion and embrace the ancient belief of old. So Constantine allowed and he even promoted the Christianization of pagan beliefs, meaning completely pagan and utterly unbiblical beliefs were given new Christian identities. What am I saying by that? Don't you ever wonder why when you will read and you will see these pictures of Caesar Bourget, whom people call Jesus, doesn't he always have a halo or a sun mm. above him? It's true. Never wondered why? Because many of the images of what they now call Caesar Bourget or Jesus mm. were first images of the Greek or the Roman god called Apollyon. Apollyon was a son of Zeus, or a son of Neptune, the Greek equivalent of Zeus, or the Roman equivalent of Zeus. And Apollyon was known as the son of the morning. He was known as the sun god. So then they would trans just change some paintings, and then they would change the way he looked a bit, but they would keep the sun. So that all of those that worship Apollyon, they knew that if you, every image that has a sun, is to the glory of Apollyon. Okay. So they will then put on the image of so-called Caesar Bourget, but they will still keep the sun intact. Yeah. So that all the worshippers of Apollyon, when they will see the image, they will say, ah, the name changed, but it is still the same okay. demon. They can, still identify. they can still relate themselves to Apollyon. That is what Constantine did. The insertion of images the insertion of pagan traditions in the holy faith. That is what modern day Christianity is today. Some of the examples of the abominations that are integrated in Christianity, I will only give you the name so you can do your research at home yourself. Just type in modern day Christianity and the cult of Isis. The cult of Isis. Many Isis was known as the mother goddess. Isis was known as the mother goddess. Today, the day, especially in the Roman Catholic Church, they worship Maria. Ave Maria. They worship her. They say she's the intercessor between men and Elohim. Wow. If you go to the Catholic temples, you just type in Google. The Pope bowing down before Mary. You will see the most powerful man on this planet, the Pope, bowing down to a statue. So the cult of Isis is integrated in Christianity by means of images. Mm. Many of us may say, no, no, we don't bow down to Mary. We are true Christians. Mm. You don't have to bow down to Mary to still incorporate the cult of Isis because you still bow down to Caesar. That's right. One and the same. They have incorporated statutes in the temple of Elohim, which was forbidden. You don't bow down to Mary, but go to Latin America, to these Christian churches. Won't you see a statue of a cross with a man standing on that cross? And then you will see these Latins. Oh, Santa Gria, Santa Gria. Mm. La palabra de Jesús. Mm. Bowing down to images, it has never changed. Mm. You claim yourself to be a Pentecost. Uh, one day we have to talk about the Pentecost. Mm. For that one, it will take a whole month, especially tailored to the Pentecostal ones. Pentecostal. The, they call themselves the charismatic ones. Charismatic. The apostolic sources. Mm. The anointing. One day we will talk about that one for a whole month. Mm. But as for now, you call yourself Pentecost. Mm. But if you go, if I go to a, your room, you have the image of Caesar there. Mm. Is that not the worshipping of images? Introduced by the Catholics. Mm. 
Another thing you can type in to look at what has influenced and ruined modern day Christianity is the Mithraism. It was the Mithraism before modern day Christianity was introduced. That was the faith that most of the Romans worshipped. And in that Mithraism, you will see that it was not just because of a uh, because of coincidence, because Caesar Borgia was the son of the Pope, that he was used as the image to represent the Messiah. It was because at that time there was a deity in Roman Catholic Church or in the Roman Church. That deity was known as Myth as, as Mithraim. Now this Mithraim, if you look at him, if you type in statues of Mithraim, you will see he looks exactly like Caesar. Wow. He looks exactly like Caesar. So now they took Caesar, who looked like that, that Roman deity, worshipping Mithraism, and then they changed his name and they called him Jesus. So all the people that were worshipping Mithraism, when they would come and they would see that image, what would they say? They only change the name when they are still worshiping our God. Mm. Another thing you can type in is, well, let me just stop there. Because after this time, we will then talk about uh, one question I still have regarding to the prosecution that we will bring it to an end for today and continue tomorrow. So what I've written down is that basically... What we see here is that by the influence of the world's most powerful man at that point in time, Constantine the Great, the Roman Empire all of a sudden became Christians. However, but they became it not after the way of holiness, but they mingled with the holy faith, pagan customs, and ancient traditions. And so the Messiah was wise and he said, do not follow the traditions of men, but follow the ways of Elohim. The Roman Catholic Church, they introduced the traditions of men inside of the church. The sprinkling of babies, baptizing babies, the eating of something which was not even unleavened and called it the holy meal and the body, the Santa Grias, as they call it. The, the putting in of images in the holy temples of Elohim, worshipping of baby angels. They forbade that men could marry if they wanted to fill in that priesthood of theirs. But the Bible said, Behold, in the last days this shall happen. Men will listen to false doctrines, but they would forbid to marry. Who do you think it was talking about? Good question. It was talking about this beast that would come. Because it said, In the latter days this would happen. To whom did it happen? The root of Christianity, the Catholic Church, forbidding men to marry. They introduced it. What else did they introduce? Mm. They changed all the days. Mm. Worshipping on Sunday. Mm. Taking it away from the Sabbath day. Mm. Why do you think they worship on Sunday? Mm. Sunday to the glory of the sun god Apollyon. Wow. Because they worship the sun god. Mm. So what day to worship the sun god but on the sun yeah. day? Wow. They introduced Christmas. Mm. That happened at Saul Invictus mm. to the glory of their three deities. Mm. They introduced the Trinity. Mm. Where in the Bible you find the Trinity? Because the Greeks had a pantheon. Therefore, the Romans also had a pantheon mm. consisting of three gods. The Greeks had Zeus mm. as the god of Olympus, the god of the heavens. Mm. And then they had Hades mm. as the god of the underworld. And then they had who? Neptune as the god of the sea. Those three stood for the Greek pantheon. Now the Romans also had their equivalent. So they also had three deities. Therefore, what did they do with modern day Christianity? They introduced the Trinity. Talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. All these things they did. But the funny thing is, let me continue reading, then I will conclude. So you will see that they became Christians, but not after the way of holiness. But they mingled with the holy faith, pagan customs, and ancient traditions. And afterwards, they conquered the whole world under the flag of Christianity and under the guise of peace. Revelation 6 and 1. We still have five minutes. Revelation 6 and 1. 
Read fast for me, please. Revelation chapter 6 from verse 1. Uh -huh. And I saw when the Lamb Listen. opened one of the seals. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. And I heard. And I heard. As it were the noise of thunder. As it were the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying. One of the four beasts said. Come and see. Come and see. And I saw. And I saw. What and, did you see? And behold. And behold. White horse. A white horse. Now pay attention. In the book of Revelation, there are two times that they mention white horses. There is one time a white horse, and then at the end there is also a white horse. The white horse that will come at the end, Revelation about 21, is the Messiah coming. But the white horse of Revelation 6 is the beast coming. They will come and they will conquer the world. They will come to Latin America. They will come to Africa. How did they come conquering the world? With the image of Caesar. Yes, with the image of Caesar, they would come conquering the world. Now we are so messed up that when you speak about African traditions, these pastors in the church, they call it witchcraft. They say, don't follow the ancient tradition. We have to follow Christianity. Do you know how you became Christians? Wow. We always talk about how Islam is a violent religion and that the Muslims gain their converts by violent means. But have you heard about the Christian crusades? Go and type in the crusades. Yeah, Christianity is a religion of peace. America calls itself a Christian nation. Mm. What have they done to the Iraqis? Mm. What have they done to us Africans? Mm. What have they done to our brothers that are now called Negroes? Mm. Were they not Christians? Did you know that the Pope sanctioned slavery? Wow. Let me repeat that. Did you know that the Pope sanctioned slavery? Listen to this one. Type in the Doom Diversas. Doom diversus. At Google, type in the doom diversus. In English, it literally means until different, which is a paper bull issued on the 18th of June, 1452, written by Pope Nicholas V. And in this letter, the Pope authorized Afonso V of Portugal to conquer, to conquer the Saracens and the pagans and to consign them to perpetual servitude. Conducted by the Pope. So this explains why, so in order to break free from persecution and slavery, many people converted into Christianity to escape the sword and death. That is why you see that many countries, especially in Africa and Latin America, are Catholics and Christians today. They did not become it because they had a choice. It was either Caesar or death. Wow. Either Caesar or death. So don't talk to Muslims and eh, you guys are violent. Do you know how many blood the Christians have shed? Do you know how many blood the Templars of England have shed? In the name of Jesus. Do you know how many blood the Cavaliers have, have shed? Christianity is a, is a, is a faithful... Yeah. Are you serious? I wish I had two more hours, but it is coming to an end now. Mm. I've talked about the introduction to the Catholic Church. I've talked about the fourth beast, which is the Roman Empire, and the woman, which is the papacy, or the church that shall come at the head of the Roman Empire. Next week, we will continue. May Yahuwah Elohim give you wisdom and insight. May you study this week so that you can catch up with me next week. Shalom.